Hi, folks. I'm Peter Covino, uh, the director of this conference, and I want to welcome you. Um, I wanted to, <clears throat> I'm, I'm reading different notes. I wanted to mention that this event is going to be streamed live on the URI website. And tomorrow it will be available on the URI YouTube site too. So we need you to um, maybe be a little more quiet than usual, um, but you can definitely continue eating and snacking. And uh, the good thing is that you actually can watch it again tomorrow if you've missed some things and, and think about it too. So thank you so much, all of you, for being here. I promised you perfect weather today. Do you remember that? And I'm happy to deliver on that promise. Tomorrow might be a little stormy, but um, we're grateful for that as well. If you're sitting in the back and you don't mind moving forward, we'd appreciate that because we do expect some people to straggle in. Um, but I think you're doing a good job. Thanks for filling in the front. I'd like quickly to highlight some of the added program features that we hope have enhanced the conference offerings this year. For the first time, we've initiated a scholarship program, and with special support from a grant by the Rhode Island State Council of Arts, we were able to provide 10 full, oh, 11, I'm sorry, that's right, 11 full scholarships to talented writers in varied genres from right here in Rhode Island, of course, and from such far away places as Florida, Chicago, Pennsylvania, and Texas. We believe this national conversation is crucial to the networking goals of the conference participants. Special thanks to the Citizens Bank Foundation and Dean Winnie Brownell, as well as our scholarship committee and conference planning committee. Would you please stand for a second, our committee, just so they recognize you. I know you're shy and don't want people necessarily clap for you, but if you would just wave your hand. Thank you. I want to, I just want to emphasize how grateful, grateful we are for the committee's valuable time, and in many cases, even funds out of their own pockets, so we're especially grateful. This year, we continued and expanded our special mentoring feature, whereby participants have the opportunity to meet one-on-one -on -one with distinguished presenters to receive intensive critiques and advice about their work. We also added more networking opportunities for participants and presenters to mingle, including more time between events and slightly longer keynote sessions, so you have more time to ask questions today. And that will happen at the end of Julia Glass's inspirational lecture, and then a reading, and then some time for Q&A. In addition to featured readings by distinguished writers such as Julia Glass, Wayne Kostenbaum, and Jacqueline Oshio, who's here already, so we thank you. We've once again included special panel discussions that feature local established writers along with craft seminars that were particularly well received last year. This year we're offering specific presentations about writing and publishing and new media where participants can hear detailed accounts of many do's and don'ts of the publishing world. I would also like to extend a special thank you to our volunteers and particularly to our outgoing English department chair, Stephen Barber, and our incoming chair, Ryan Trim, whom you'll hear from um, shortly. And this year's conference coordinator, Tatiana Yuhach. <laughs> whose tireless attention to many details involved in the months long planning effort have been much appreciated. And now to welcome you further, our Dean of Arts and Science, Winifred Brownell. And then briefly, you'll hear from Ryan Trim, our new English department chair. And after that, Nikki Toller, a member of our conference committee, who is also the web designer. And if you've seen our website this year, 
You'll agree that it's spectacular. We're just thrilled. And she will be introducing keynote speaker, Julia Glass. Thank you again for being here. Peter's a little tiny bit taller than I am, you may have noticed. <laughs> On behalf of the University of Rhode Island and the College of Arts and Sciences, I am truly honored to welcome you today to our fourth annual Ocean State Summer Writing Conference. Well, my favorite guilty pleasure, to confess, is reading the work of talented writers, both fiction and nonfiction. And I love the fact that the conference present so many gift-giving opportunities for me at the table outside, and I hope you will also take a close look at the wonderful work being presented. Our conference brings together nationally known writers, along with members of the very thriving Southern New England writing community, and very talented aspiring writers. We really listen to participants' requests, and I applaud the planning committee because I know sometimes I've been to conferences where you make suggestions and you wonder if anyone even looks at them, but I've seen evidence every year that they take them very seriously and that informs the planning for the next year. And in fact, this year, we've added an extra two-day advanced fiction workshop in our part one offerings, as well as a two-day workshop on writing and publishing. Both of those sessions just ended, and you missed a real treat if you couldn't participate. But have no fear, there are many other similar and exciting readings, craft talks, publishing workshops, and so, and so forth over the course of the next two days. We're also really thrilled to announce that the Alumni Association, thanks to Jan Wenzel of our Advancement Division, who spearheaded the effort, has now established a URI Alumni Affinity Group for writers that will focus on promoting writing and reading events throughout the year. We know that where once people might have connected as alumni to institutions to the year they graduated in today's world, that's not the, the issue that, or the fact that bonds most people together. Uh, it's affinity groups, and therefore I think our writers certainly deserve this. We hope that all alumni, URI alumni who may be here, will formally sign on to the committee and continue to be involved in the vital work of our fellow writers. There's a note in your program about how to sign up or please see one of the conference committee members. Yesterday evening, in fact, the Alumni Association co-sponsored a reading event that featured several alumni presenters from various genres. And I hope this will be an annual event at the conference. At our participants' request, we have once again been able to offer three full days of exciting conference activities. In fact, we have even more presenters this year than last year, 34 presenters in three days. You may ask how in this economy, in part it's due to the, the great efforts of the planners and Peter Covino for writing those grants and also our sponsors who jumped on board and our, several of our presenters who didn't charge their usual fee, or who absolutely donated their time as volunteers. So we have a rich feast that obviously transcends our funding. The Creative Writing Program, and I hope you will indulge me for a little good news, <laughs> within our English department, continues to enjoy consistent growth. And this year, we've been very fortunate to have four of our undergraduates accepted in top university MFA programs, some with full fellowships including admittance into stellar programs such as Sarah Lawrence, the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, Emerson College, and Columbia College of Chicago. The energy that you have supplied, the inspiration that you have given to our students at this conference really helped, I think, uh, our university achieve this goal, and we expect the growth of such acceptances to continue. I want to congratulate last year's coordinator of the conference, Claire McCard, who was accepted into NYU Law School. We know that her work on writing helped her get in, at least we'd like to think so. We are especially uh, grateful as well uh, for her many efforts and making the conference run seamlessly last year. We are very pleased today uh, to recognize that President Emeritus, Emeritus Robert Carruthers who for 18 years served as the 10th president of the University of Rhode Island and is now a distinguished university professor, and he happens to be a published and award-winning poet, is here yet again uh, to our conference because he's been just such a sustained 
supporter of this conference effort. So thank you. Thank you very much, Bob. <laughs> I know our new leadership team also supports the arts, David M. Dooley, our president, and uh, Donald DeHaze, our provost, and we hope to see them at a future conference. As the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, I'm particularly pleased and truly honored to support these efforts to educate and network so many talented writers. And of course, for the exceptional opportunities that this conference affords the greater Rhode Island community, as well as our students, university employees, and faculty alike. It's been really a joy to discover the writers in our community. I, I didn't even realize we're so interested in writing because they play other very important roles and contribute professional expertise in different fields. And so that's been a real pleasure to embrace them. Despite a difficult economic climate we're all facing, enrollment in this year's conference has remained steady with, I guess the latest figure I heard, with over 130 registrants and uh, presenters and volunteers for a total of, I guess now over 170 participants, not including the keynote events that are open to the general public. Not surprisingly, we've also seen an increase in the number of non-student attendees as a result of interest in the creative writing courses we offer at the university. We've added an additional online course this summer and look forward to expanding our offerings in the future to include several more screen and dramatic writing opportunities and perhaps even related seminars on feature article writing and generalist writing courses in related genres, including journalism and the arts. In addition to those already mentioned, the organizing committee, the program in women's studies, and the division of university advancement deserve special acknowledgement this year, as does this year's capable coordinator, the fabulous Tatiana Yuhach. And especially, um, a person who never wants me to thank him, but I, I know how much we owe him, the incredible Peter Cavino. Please help me congratulate him. Writers really enrich the quality of our lives. And I want to thank you for being here and best wishes in your future writing. Good afternoon. As you heard from Peter, I'm Ryan Trim. I am the new chair of the Department of English, and it's my great uh, privilege and pleasure to welcome you all to the Ocean State Writing Conference. This is indeed a moment for expressing gratitude for those who have made this conference possible. I want to add my own thanks to the tireless organizers whose labor made this event uh, such a success, especially to you, Tatiana. Uh, I should also add that none of this would be possible without the assistance of Michelle Caraccia and Gretchen Lowley, uh, who have made all of this go so smoothly. And I also want to express particular gratitude to you, Dean Brownell, uh, who you have been such a tireless and, and strong champion for events uh, such as this one that adds so much to the university. Uh, most particularly, um, we and I uh, owe a huge debt of gratitude to Peter Covino, uh, who has now orchestrated four of these conferences, and all of them have been a wonderful success. Since arriving at URI in 2006, Peter has worked tirelessly with colleagues such as Mary Capella to raise the profile of creative writing at URI. A wonderful speaker series in this conference will display what he has accomplished. So special thanks to you, Peter. In many ways, having a writer's conference in Rhode Island is a natural fit. It has been home to John Hawks, Jumpy Lahira, H.P. Lovecraft, Anne Hood, and Robert Coover, besides many, many other distinguished authors. For such a small state has produced more than its share of significant men and women of letters. This activity signals the momentum of creativity in the state, a buzz that has found a home at the University of Rhode Island. Creative writing has long been a centerpiece of our department. We have prize-winning authors in our faculty, such as Peter and Mary. Creative writing has always been a core part, part of our pedagogic mission um, at both the undergraduate and graduate levels, and Dean Brownell detailed for you some of the successes of our students. Indeed, many of our students, past and present, will be taking part this weekend. 
Uh, this past year, I served as director of graduate studies. I'm now chair. In both positions, I've witnessed just how much energy and excitement surround our creative writing offerings. Our courses and events attract writers across the region and nation. These poets, fiction writers, playwrights, authors of creative nonfiction, and screenwriters all come to URI. I'll witness activity and enthusiasm here. Creative writing is a vital part of the Department of English and the entire university. I know you're all eager to hear Julia Glass and the other distinguished features here, the speakers here uh, to get back to the discussions and the panels, workshops, classes, and presentations to continue the readings and dialogues that all make this conference such a wonderful event. I'll conclude by thanking you all for making the journey here to Kingston and to wish you, with Don Dean Brownell, happy writing. Thank you. Good afternoon. I think I better do that. My name is Nikki Toller, and it is my great honor to introduce Julie Glass to you today and to welcome her to the fourth annual Ocean State Summer Writings Conference here at the university. Julie Glass is the author of three novels, Three Dunes, The Whole World Over, and The Witherer's Tale, which will be published in September. Three Dunes, her first novel, won the National Book Award for Fiction in 2002, and her third book, I See You Everywhere, a collection of linked stories, won the 2009 SUNY John Gardner Fiction Award. Other awards for her fiction include the Sense of Place Award, the Tobias Wolf Award, and the Pirate's Alley Met Medal for Best Novella. Julia Glass was trained as a painter, but became a writer because she was in love with language. She loved to read fiction, the novels of Hardy and Elliot, and in Three Junes, she created the rich, expansive story of the McLeod family the kind of novel her 19th century literary heroes would most certainly have admired. Always the artist, this, in this novel of three parts, she offers us a compelling triptych of contemporary life. With the sim sensibilities of a painter, Julia Glass infuses her novels with light, color, texture, and a vibrancy of spirit, creating vivid scenes and elegant tapestries filled with detail. The opening lines of Three Junes reveal her artist eye and love of language. She begins with the story of family patriarch Paul McLeod traveling abroad to come to terms with his loneliness. Paul chose Greece for its predictable whiteness, the blanching heat by day, the rush of stars at night, the glint of the lime-washed houses crowding its coast blinding, searing, somnolent, fossilized Greece. Layering her narrative in the same delicious way pastry chef Queenie Duquette creates those magnificent confections in the whole world over, Julia Glass engages us in big stories with ensemble casts. With the same deft hand, she draws nuanced characters with complicated lives, characters we long remember, like Fennel MacLeod, who thankfully appears in two of her novels, and the Jardine sisters, Louisa and Clem in I See You Everywhere, whose often troubled relationship she likens to a double helix, two souls coiling around a common axis, joined but never touching. The stories of Julia Glass explore the complex relationship of brothers and sisters, friends and lovers, husbands and wives, real people learning to live with loss, the nature of love in all its forms, and what she calls the never-ending questions of the human heart. And finally, what I so admire about Julia Glass is the buoyancy and sense of life she conveys as her characters deal with life's heartbreaks, like Louisa Jardine must do after uns an unspeakable loss. In I See You Everywhere, she writes, and that's when I understand in every grieving nerve in the bustling nest of my heart that in this life, the only life there is, Clem and I disagreed often, but we agreed on that. The last word is mine, and it is a gift. Please join me in welcoming Julia Glass.
Hi, everybody. I'm so glad to be here. Um, when I hear an introduction like that, that's so incredibly well and accurately researched, um, I, I'm, you know, I'm a little overwhelmed, so I have to take a deep breath here. Thank you very much, Nikki. And I'm, I'm going to see if I can do this by holding the microphone, um, as if I'm Jay Leno or something. Um, okay, so. I tend to leave writing these talks till the very last minute, which you'll notice as I as I read this talk to you. Um, and I didn't know exactly what approach I was going to take until last week when I got a call from uh, a reporter at the Providence Journal who, who interviewed me for an article about this conference. And he asked me if I'd been attending conferences like this since the days before I was a published writer. And I had to say no. And let me tell you, those days were many since from the time I started submitting short stories to magazines and journals, it took seven years for me to get my first my fiction into print at all, and then another nine to publish a book. To some of you, my story is an inspiration. But I suspect that to many of you, it's a bit of a nightmare. <laughs> and as I was taking the train down from Massachusetts this morning, I was sitting next to a guy reading the newspaper paper article about that amazing match at Wimbledon that has gone on for three days. I don't know how many of you are tennis fans. It's very hard to miss this story. In my house, the three guys I live with are all avid tennis fans, so they've been, you know, following it live on some news feed. But this is a history-making match. The, the final of five um, sets cannot have a tiebreaker. It has to go until it's won. And, um, it was finished after play that took more than 10 hours over three days with, I'm not going to know exactly, but I think the final game score on that fifth set was something like 82 to 79 or 81 to 79. And so yesterday they stopped or two days ago, they stopped play at 59 games all. And I thought these guys are insane. You know, they ha somebody has got to have a nervous breakdown or quit. But if you look at the paper today, so finally, our guy, whose name I think is um, John Isner, uh, who's gone from obscurity to fame very fast, uh, won this game. I don't even want to think about the French guy with the unpronounceable name who did not. But I looked at that picture of John Isner sinking to the grass in triumph and pure exhaustion. And I thought, you know, that's kind of how I felt when I got that phone call that I was finally going to have a short story published. I mean, I went through seven years of hearing, no, no, thank you. Really great, but not for us. You know, all those. In fact, I think the encouraging rejections are what kept me writing. So I attended my first writer's conference in 1999 when I won a prize for a novella called Collies that would eventually become my first novel, Three Junes. The conference was in New Orleans. I didn't know anyone there. And at first, I felt a little bit like the proverbial deer in the headlights. I remember seeing the list of authors who'd be attending the conference as teachers and panelists, the kind of people I thought, thought of back then as real writers. Most of them fell into the kitchen sink category that critics call Southern writers. And the main topic of the conference was the life and work of Walker Percy. Well, not only did I realize that I had read not a word published by any of the panelists or teachers, or for that matter, the judge of my prize, but I had read two books by Walker Percy and intensely disliked them both. <laughs> so I was petrified. It never occurred to me that the writers I'd meet, including the wonderful author who deemed my novella worthy of that prize, were hardly going to quiz me about my knowledge of their work. And as for Walker Percy, he was dead and buried. <laughs> I should add that the minute I learned the identity of the judge who had awarded me the prize, I ran straight to my local bookstore and bought his most famous novel. He was James Wilcox. In fact, he's, he's still James Wilcox. <laughs> And the book was called Modern Baptists. And if you haven't read it, you really must. <clears throat> I've never read another book like it. I'll skip over the details, but after three days in the company of all these mostly Southern writers, along with agents, editors, and for some weird reason, I never figured out a few movie stars, 
as well as all the fledglings like me, I returned home to New York with energy to burn. I confess that I was a little hungover. One true stereotype about Southern writers is that they really know how to party. But I had a suitcase jammed with books by several of the authors I'd met. I had begun a new friendship with the writer who won the short story award. We were actually awarded medals with the image of William Faulkner on them and wore them on long gold ribbons around town after the ceremony. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> but I couldn't wait to get back to my computer. I suppose the simple conclusion to be drawn is that we come to these events to fill up on inspiration and make or renew connections. Seen this way, the best writers' conference is like an all-night gas station attached to a very groovy diner. And, if you're in New Orleans, a revolving bar that serves till 4 a.m. I'm assuming there's no revolving bar here at URI. If there is, please clue me in. But over the past 10 years, attending more of these gatherings, I've noticed that when everything clicks, it's more complex than that. When it goes well, the experience addresses all the central issues of how and why we do what we do. First of all, take the connections we make. Never mind the fantasies of finding an agent or an editor or even a teacher who thinks you're the next Alice Siebold and scoops you up as a hot property or a favored protege. Even I want to be scooped up as the next Alice Siebold. I'm talking about the conversations and workshops and meals where we interact with our true peers, the people who write what you love to read or what you wish that you could write. It became obvious to me a long time ago that whether you're new to the game or have a Pulitzer Prize under your belt, as long as you write, you are a real writer. I came to writing fiction through a side door. I've always loved reading, but in college and well beyond, as Nikki told you, I pursued my other great love, which was painting and drawing. Only in my early 30s did I turn from making pictures to telling stories. And the reason I couldn't do both is that I had to make a living and I couldn't make a living at either one. <laughs> my only classroom work in creative writing at the time dated back to high school. And because I was stubborn, and truthfully, probably because I was also a little bit arrogant, I persisted on my own. I wrote in solitude without sharing my work or talking shop with fellow writers. There are pros and cons to this way of working, and nowhere is that more apparent than at gatherings like this one. Ideally, we're all here to learn from one another, to exchange ideas, to help one another tackle our weaknesses and burnish our strengths. But that's to ignore the simple truth that there's an irrepressible undertow of rivalry, which there always is, whether we like it or not. The double-sided coin of camaraderie and competition. Ambition is a key ingredient to success, but it always involves the desire to get ahead, and getting ahead implies that others must be left behind. That's the uncomfortable truth, but it's not entirely a negative. For the last two years of living in New York City, which I did for a total of 24 years, I wrote at a place called the Writer's Room, an open communal loft space where 40 or 50 writers might be clacking away at once on their keyboards. I could no longer write at home in my very small apartment because my two small children and their babysitter needed to use that space, particularly once the weather got cold. I actually tried having them go out to the park for a few weeks and just letting me have the apartment, but that didn't work. Three Junes had already been published and it had made a splash, and I was partway into writing my second novel. So you might assume I felt secure in my writerly identity and methods, but no. To work in this group setting was a huge, unnerving change from the way I'd written for the preceding 10 years, on the one table in my apartment, all alone with the refrigerator in one room and a tempting bed and bookcase in the other. But while many distractions were removed in this new setting, it took me a while not to listen anxiously to how fast some people were typing around me 
or to notice as I passed various cubicles, stacks of research materials, reams of notes, and charts of scenes in a story. I kept seeing this like a grid. Somebody finally told me that those charts belonged to the screenwriters who belonged to the room, which was a huge relief. For a few weeks, I felt too self-conscious to concentrate until gradually I got to know a few of these writers when we stepped into the kitchen to drink coffee, read the paper, eat lunch, or just find somebody to procrastinate with. There in the kitchen, people talked constantly about deadlines, contracts, agents, book tours. One member was an accomplished travel writer who was always in the midst of telling a story about a new four-star hotel in Marrakesh or an uncharted island in the South Pacific. He always had a perfect, authentically outdoorsy tan. Another member was writing a memoir about having lived for a few years in the idyllic and primitive Italian village where his grandfather grew up. I had recurring shop talk conversations, not just with fellow novelists, but with a professional astrologer, an art historian, and a cartoonist who also wrote children's picture books. I liked some of these people, and I tolerated others. Certain members of the room avoided socializing altogether. They came and went as if wearing blinders. I suspected that some of them felt that one could as easily become consumed by envy as by admiration and delight in the variations on a theme that we all represented to one another. But delighting in those variations is essential to becoming reinvigorated, and it's something we tend to forget when we're off in our respective caves, working alone as we must ultimately do. Envy, if you deal with it honestly and circumspectly, is a minor side effect. A sense of competition can remind you how high you need to set the bar. Personally, my advice is to set yourself up in competition with writers like, just to cite some examples, Faulkner or Austin or Tolstoy or Frost, because it's hard to be terribly jealous of people who are dead. <laughs> And it's funny how, even though they're dead, they're still the best teachers of the craft. Their method is the epitome of showing, not telling, though that so-called rule of fiction is as problematic as the next. I teach a one-week intensive fiction workshop in Provincetown every summer, and I've begun to notice something that happens almost right away in our earliest workshop exchanges. Many writers have favorite books about the craft of writing fiction. And as you know, those books are legion. But I have yet to encounter a single one of these books that doesn't lay down a set of cardinal rules telling you what you must do or be to achieve any degree of mastery. So what happens early on in a typical workshop is this. We are looking at a story by writer A. Writer B completely in the spirit of being helpful, tells writer A that, for instance, it's dangerous to write in the first person before you are a writer of long experience, or that you're asking for trouble if you relate a character's dream, or that you should, when revising, strive to eliminate all adverbs. Writer A will cite the book in which he or she read this dictum. The book is almost always by a fiction writer we all know and love. What, I want to know, compels these otherwise savvy people to lay down bossy laws about how to write beyond the basic stuff we learned in grade school about grammar, syntax, and punctuation. I have stood on stage and listened to countless writers I esteem tell the audience that you simply must put words down on paper or on that computer screen every day. Some say you have to write for a specific amount of time. Others, that you must turn out a specific number of pages. If not, they imply you are nothing but a dilettante. I have heard panelists warn straight writers against attempting to write from a gay point of view or white writers to adopt a viewpoint of color. I'm sorry, but quotas and political correctness 
have no place in the writing of fiction, whose soul is nourished on the one hand by idiosyncrasy and on the other by unbridled empathy, imagining ourselves in the shoes of people completely unlike us. In my early years of writing, nothing intimidated or discouraged me more than bumping up against these rules and worrying that by refusing to follow them, I would be left out in the cold. So I want to take just a few of the most notorious. Write what you know. Well, okay, start with what you know. But write what you want to know and always dare to know more than you even think you can. Go ahead and fake it, and then do your research. Or maybe not. <laughs> Sal Rushdi once said that when reviews of a new book come out, he's worried less about whether critics like the book than he is about whether he's gotten away with it. <laughs> Keep a journal. If you already do, great. You're fortunate to have that resource. But every time I've attempted to start a journal, and I've tried several times, I fail for the simple reason that I feel like I'm writing a letter to no one. Don't talk about your themes, characters, or plots, or you will lose the magic. So what's the point of sharing or workshopping our stories? We're left to speculate how much better Hawthorne and Melville would have been without their correspondence, likewise Updike and Cheever. Don't read while you're writing something new because your work might become tainted by undue pernicious influence. Now that's a favorite of mine. And I was put in a pickle when I was on a panel a couple of years ago with a writer I really like who turned to me and said, you never read while you're working on something new, do you? Because even though I don't by any means write new stuff every day, I can go weeks without adding words to a story or a novel. I'm thinking about my characters every day. There's no vacation from my imagination. I sometimes wish there were. So then when am I supposed to do the reading that matters to me? After I retire, which by economic necessity is never. In fact, now that I think about that rule, let's turn it around. Undo influence, bring it on. Since I'm starting a new book right now, as a matter of fact, why not turn my bedside table into a Bermuda Triangle of influence? Say, George Eliot, Alice Munro, and James Thurber. I would die to be influenced by those writers. In fact, how can you possibly write well if you're not reading well at the same time? So here are two rules I believe all writers of all genres should follow. One, revise until you're cross-eyed. Two, back up your computer files. <laughs> so it seems to me that when we come together here, one of the most important things we do is remind ourselves how many, many different ways there are to practice your craft. Each of us may follow private guidelines, and it's fun as well as useful to share them, to try out the rituals that work for someone else. And if a teacher gives you exercises to broaden your methods or break bad habits, so much the better. But if the new methods or guidelines don't work, chuck them out the window and don't feel guilty. As John Gardner puts it in the beautiful book on becoming a novelist, which I, I recommend highly, there is almost no wrong way to write fiction. There are only ways that, for a given writer, are more efficient or less. Writing fiction or poetry or essays is not analogous to performing a liver transplant or building a bridge. I wish I could say it's not like fixing a leaky oil well miles below the surface of the ocean, but it's pretty scary how much BP's trial and error Rube Goldberg remedies are beginning to resemble the way I begin writing a novel, one shaky start after another. My point is that there's a good reason writers do not have to be board certified in order to attain publication. When we're all alone doing the actual work, it can seem both frivolous and absurd, simply a Baroque way of contemplating our navels. I'll be the first to confess that some of the fiction I've written has felt in its genesis 
purely therapeutic. But when we come together and talk about the power that some stranger's novel or poem or essay can exert on our lives, whether it gives us comfort, opens our eyes, widens our worldview, or just makes us laugh, we renew our faith in the larger purpose of what we do, which means that we need to talk about the writers and the books we admire. And nowhere do we have a richer opportunity to do this than at a writer's conference. I'll say it again, the greatest teachers of writing are good books. I'm living proof. For the decade I pursued my ambitions as a painter throughout my 20s, during which I took no writing classes, I read more good fiction than I'll ever read again in that period of time. Inside me, I, and this is kind of the way I think of it, all those books were somehow forming a pearl that became the source of what I can only call my talent or my gift or my motivation. I'm not sure what it is, but that was the genesis of my compulsion to start writing fiction. I now begin every workshop I teach by asking each writer not just to introduce him or herself, but to recommend to everyone else at least one terrific book that the others might not know about. So right now I'm going to recommend to you three terrific works of fiction I've read in the past year, none of which has appeared on the New York Times bestseller list. First, The Confessions of Edward Day, a novel by the highly accomplished yet to my mind, under-recognized Valerie Martin. Two, A Long, Long Time Ago and Essentially True, a first novel by Bridget Pasulka that is either just out in paperback or about to be. Incredible first novel. Third, a remarkable collection of linked novellas called Extraordinary Renditions, by Andrew Irvin, that's E-R-V-I-N, and that will be published by Coffee House Press in September. I was very fortunate to be asked to blurb it, and I'm often asked to blurb books, and I, I blurb many good books, but I was, I was kind of blown away by this collection. And not only do you need to read books, and I'm gonna get on a soapbox now, but you need to buy books. A literary agent I know told me recently that when he meets fiction writers longing to be published, he tells them point blank that they do not have the moral right to be published if they don't buy at least two hardcover books a month. He goes so far as to say that those two books must be one novel and one collection of short stories. I would agree with him that you do have an obligation to support both the industry and the artistic community of which you would like to be a part and are a part. I have friends who are well enough off to eat dinner out at a nice restaurant several times a month, yet who complain that $25 is a very steep price for a book, which, will, which would give you the greater, more lasting pleasure. A fine French meal for $50, probably without the wine, or two of the three books I just recommended to you. An IMAX 3D movie costs more than a trade paperback, as does admission to most art museums. Furthermore, you really do need to buy your books from independent books, booksellers, which you can easily do these days online if you don't happen to live near a good independent bookseller. Because if you don't do this, Bookstores run by people with authentic, individual taste will go out of business, and once they do, they're probably not coming back. There will no longer be places where people can browse other than the formulaically stocked chain stores in strip malls. And I'm not suggesting boycotting the chains, but, um, but I really think that one of the most important duties we have as writers is to support independent booksellers. Browsing is one of the only ways in which many readers find the countless books that don't get any reviews or publicity and may not even be stopped by the chains. I also suggest that you subscribe to at least one literary journal. I happen to get, um, and I just love this one, and maybe I'm sure you know this one, it's called One Story, and I didn't check, but I think it 
I know it's more than 12 issues. I think there are 16 of these little magazines that come to you over the course of a year. And I believe I paid, I pay $18 a year for that subscription. I mean, that's, is that a lot of bang for your buck or what? And they publish people's debut stories along with the stories of, of writers whose novels you've read. It's a really wonderful mix of, of different sensibilities in fiction. You can accuse me of laying down laws for writers, but all I'm doing is pointing out a moral responsibility we have to our community to keep the fires burning and the mortgages paid. My general buying philosophy is this, and I'm only half joking. I buy hard covers by authors who look like they might still have kids to put through college, and I buy paperbacks by authors who are six feet under. <laughs> Finally, one of the best and most ironic reasons we come together and talk ourselves blue at these conferences is to renew our commitment to work that is ultimately solitary by nature. Sadly, the simple state of solitude is growing, is gravely endangered these days, as is our ability and even desire to sink into the world of the imagination for any great length of time. I think of myself as a chronic daydreamer, and at every new leap of communications technology, I struggle to resist. Yet by now, even I feel the constant itch to check my email, and that delicious interlude of quiet time I used to relish while on book tour, all that time spent in airport waiting lounges, is now relentlessly invaded by the din of ubiquitous TV screens and the raised voices of people talking on their cell phones. When George Orwell imagined Big Brother, the only thing he missed is that actually it's more like a big, hearty Catholic family of brothers and sisters breathing down our necks. From CNN on all those public TV screens, even in my daughter's waiting rooms, to Twitter, Facebook, Google, YouTube, Bluetooth. Need I go on? And it's funny to think that actually I might be being watched on YouTube right now by somebody. <laughs> Um, we think of these networks as tools, and, and they are tools, useful tools, but they have also become external compulsions, leaving us rarely able to tolerate our own company and nothing but our own individual company for any meaningful stretch of time. I like to say that we are suffering a cultural epidemic of solo phobia, the fear of being truly alone. People ask me again and again, how in the world I've written so much in the past few years. On the one hand, I don't actually think I'm all that prolific as compared to a number of other novelists. On the other hand, and this is the truth, I can't really remember putting in a lot of time at the computer keyboard because I actually don't. I look at my books, like here's my, I'm gonna read from my, in a few minutes from my fourth novel. And I look at these books when they come out and I'm actually kind of perplexed by them. How in the world did all these pages get written? But here's the answer. Most of the work I do as a fiction writer takes place in my head when I am not at the computer. I'm shopping or driving or waiting in line to buy stamps or taking a shower or walking the dog or just walking. And I am completely unplugged. No cell phone, though I do use one when I travel. My agent said she would murder me if I didn't get one a couple years ago. No iPod, though I do have an iPod when I have to go on the deadly boring treadmill. And definitely no Blackberry or smartphone. I refuse to admit what Jonathan Franzen calls the assault of the actual. Every day of my life includes long stretches of time when I am out of touch, unreachable, just stewing in my cerebral juices, dreaming my characters into being. A recurring marital conflict in my house arises when my mate is home with me all day because he's addicted to NPR. But when I am there, the radio must be off. No classical music, no rock, no nothing until the kids get home or it's time to prepare a meal. Not that I don't love the idea of yakking on the phone while shopping at Trader Joe's or listening to Bob Marley while I walk the dog, but I simply wouldn't be the writer I am if I did. That's the first key to my creative life. 
The second is the time I do spend at the computer, downloading all those dreams. It is hard, I admit, not, not to be constantly checking my email or going to the New York Times website to make sure another volcano hasn't flown or my favorite elderly author hasn't died or right now, as I write this, whether Obama will fire General McChrystal for partying in Paris with a reporter from Rolling Stone. The novelist Margot Livesey has tackled this problem by investing in two computers, one for writing only and the other one for all things online. She actually keeps them in two separate rooms. When I enter the elusive Marlon Brando zone of writing where I feel like I actually become my characters, it reminds me of taking a midnight swim at the pristine Idaho lake where my in-laws have a cabin. It's often hard to get into the dark, fathomless water. The temperature takes some getting used to, and I'm nervous that I can't see the bottom. But all of a sudden, there's nowhere else I'd rather be. The stars are clear far above. Bats swoop harmlessly over my head, and all I hear are the sounds of water, the wind in the trees, the insects of night. No voices, no news, no gossip. I'm just floating in the deep. Thank you. Now, if you've got any listening energy left, I'm going to read from the beginning of uh, my novel, The Widower's Tale, which comes out this September. I always feel like I have to make some kind of introduction, but you know what? It's the beginning of the book, so I shouldn't have to, right? <laughs> so, chapter one. Why, thank you. I'm getting in shape to die. Those were the first words I spoke aloud on the final Thursday in August of last summer. Thursday, I recall for certain, because it was the day on which I read in our weekly town paper about the first of what I would so blithely come to call the Crusades. The end of the month, I can also say for certain, because Elves and Fairies was scheduled that very evening to fling open its brand new, gloriously purple doors, formerly the entrance to my beloved barn, and usher in another flight of tiny, perfect children along with their preened and privileged parents. I was on the return stretch of my route du jour, the sun just gaining a vista over the trees, when a youngster who lives half a mile down my street gave me a thumbs up and drawled, use it or lose it, man. I might have ignored his insolence had he been pruning a hedge or fetching the newspaper, but he appeared merely to be lounging and smoking a cigarette on his parents' hyper-fastidiously weed-free lawn. He wore tattered trousers a foot too long and the smile of a bartender who wishes to convey that you've had one too many libations. I stopped, jogging in place, and elaborated on my initial remark. Because you see, lad, I informed him, huffing rhythmically, though still in control, I have an uncommendable authority that dying is hard work requiring diligence, stamina, and fortitude, which I intend to maintain in ample supply until the moment of truth arrives. And this was no lie. Three months before, at my daughter's Memorial Day cookout, I would overheard one of her colleagues confide to another in solemn Hippocratic tones, maternity nurses, maternity nurses love to talk about how hard it is to be born, how it's anything but passive, they explain to all these new age moms that babies come out exhausted from the work they do, how they literally muscle their way toward the light. Well, if you ask me, dying's the same. It's hard work too. The final stretch is a marathon. I've seen patients try to die but fail. Just one more thing they didn't bother to tell us in med school. Creepy, this talk of muscling one's way toward the dark though I did enjoy the concept of all those babies toiling away, lives on the line like ancient Roman tunnel workers determined to complete their passage. 
As for the youngster with trousers slouched around his bony ankles, my homily had its intended effect. When I finished, he hadn't a syllable at his service, not even the knee-jerk whatever that members of his generation mutter when conversationally cornered. As I went on my way, energized by vindication, I had a dim notion that the youngster's name was Damien, or Darius. I put him at 15, the nadir point of youth. Had he been a boy of his age some 20 years ago, I would have known his name without a second thought, not just because I would have known his parents, but because in all likelihood he would have mowed my lawn or painted my barn gratefully for an hourly wage appropriate to a teenage boy's modestly spendthrift habits. Nowadays, teenage boys with wealthy parents do not mow lawns or paint houses. If they stoop to any sort of paid activity, they help seasoned citizens learn to navigate the baffling world of computers and entertainment modules, charging an hourly wage more appropriate to the appallingly profligate habits of a drug dealer in the Bronx. <laughs> Damien Sordarian might indeed have been the one to coach my own seasoned self through the use of my new laptop computer, a retirement gift that spring from my daughters, and to fleece me accordingly, had I not been the fortunate grandfather of a very intelligent, very kind, adequately well-mannered boy of 20, who was, at the time, an honor student at Harvard. A good boy, as parents no longer dare to say, cowed by advice from some celebrity pediatrician who's probably fathered two or three litters with a sequence of abandoned wives. But that's what Robert was to me. And still, but that's what Robert was to me, and still is, or is again, despite everything that's happened. A good boy on the verge of becoming a solid, productive citizen. My grandson is a very good boy, I used to say with pride and confidence, especially with an earshot of his mother. Robert had inherited his mother's passion for science, and I had begun to assume with mixed feelings, that he planned to follow in her professional footsteps. A successful oncologist in Boston, Trudy has become marginally famous as a media source whenever some new Scandinavian study pops up to hint at anything approaching a cure. One day, watching her as she explained a controversial drug to that life-size Ken doll on the six o'clock news, it occurred to me that my younger daughter entered my living room more often as a guest of NBC than as my flesh and blood offspring. I saw Robert far more frequently. Robert stayed in close touch with me as contractors, carpenters, plumbers, and electricians jacked up and tore apart my barn so that it could become the new home of elves and fairies, Matlock's favorite progressive nursery school. Simply to look out my back windows that summer felt like spying on the public humiliation of a loyal friend, an ordeal I had engineered. When these callow strangers were not perpetrating their mutilations, buttressings, and vigorous eviscerations upon that stately structure, they treated my entire property like an amusement park. Fortuitously, despite my protests, Robert had insisted on setting up an email account when he tutored me on the use of my laptop. After decades at a job where the King Kong shadow of technology loomed ever larger and darker over the simple work I loved, I had fantasies of a quasi-Luddite retirement. I would revel in the pages of one obscurely significant novel after another, abandoning the world of gigabytes and hard drives. Cursed be the cursors. Farewell to I everything and all its pertly nicknamed apps. In a word, ha. That summer, as it turned out, I found my sleek, alarmingly versatile computer a blessing, chiefly because it meant that I heard regularly from Robert, who was working at a coastal conservation outfit up in Maine. He kept me sane by sympathizing with my fury about everything from the cigarette butts and gum wrappers I found in the Presidia bushes to the dozens of alien soda pop cans I had to haul along with my own recycling to the transfer station. Most insulting was the altered view from my desk. My copper beach so rudely upstaged by a large blue closet concealing a toilet. 
That Thursday, finally, the Blue John was carted away. The workmen were gone. My good deed was coming to fruition, and I was determined to put myself in a positive frame of mind. Yes, I was irritated by the youth in the baggy trousers and all that he personified. But he was just one sign among many that the world was changing its colors without my permission. Yes, I was apprehensive about the looming loss, possibly permanent, of certain privileges I had long taken for granted. Peace, privacy, and my daughter Clover had recently informed me, swimming naked in the pond before dark. But I had been led to expect these vexations, and I was excited to learn from Robert's latest email that he was now back in Cambridge, preparing to start his junior year. So when I came downstairs after showering, reading two chapters of Eyeless in Gaza, and shooting an e-missive to my grandson inviting him to lunch, I was almost completely happy to find my elder daughter in my kitchen. Almost. There she sat at the same table where she'd started each day for the first 17 years of her life, eating a bowl of yogurt sprinkled with what looked like bird seed, drinking tea the color of algae, and paging through my copy of The Grange. For the past year, she'd been renting part of a house across town, yet she continued to make herself at home without announcing her presence. I knew that I ought to feel an, an instinctual fatherly joy. Here she was, safe and hopeful at the very least, possibly even content. Yet most of the time I had to suppress a certain resentment that she had made such a wreck of her life and then, on top of that, made me feel responsible for her all over again. Like her younger sister, Clover hadn't lived under my roof since a summer or two during college, unless one were to count the recent period, though one would like to have forgotten it, during which she had languished here after the histrionic collapse of her marriage. For six months, until I helped her move across town and convinced my friend Norval to give her a job at his bookstore, she had gone back and forth between my house and her sister's. Hey, Daddy. Clover beamed at me. How was your run? Made it to the old artillery, I said. Wisely, she paid me no condescending compliments. She stood. Can I make you a sandwich? Thank you, I said. Turkey? Peanut butter? Egg salad? Thank you. Clover laughed her deceptively carefree laugh. At an early age, my daughters learned that I do not like unnecessary choices, yet they tease me with them all the same. My favorite restaurants, if any such remain, are the ones where you're served a meal, no questions asked, except perhaps what color wine you prefer. You can carry on a civilized conversation without being forced to hear a litany of the 20 dressings you may have on your salad, or to pretend you care what distant lake engendered your rainbow trout. As Clover assembled my lunch, she told me in meticulous detail about the last minute touches she and her new colleagues were putting on the barn to prepare for the open house that night. I sometimes wondered if she could appreciate the depth of the sacrifice I was making, all of it for her. While she twittered on about the final visit from the fire marshal, how she held her breath as he peered upward yet again at all those hundred year old rafters, my attention wandered to the newspaper open to the police log. In any given week, the most notable incident in Matlock might be loud voices reported 2 a.m. on Caspian Way, or pearl earring found under bench at train depot. But then there were such delectably absurd items as woman apprehended removing lady slippers from woods off Mallard Lane, or Caller on Reed Street complained wild turkeys blocked access to garage. A recent standout was bonehead driver reported at food co-op transfer site. That week, our fearless enforcers had coped valiantly with a Shetland pony wandering free behind the public library, a 911 hang up, the report of a weird man on a bike riding along a perfectly public road, a complaint about extensive paper detritus blowing across a hay field, and a car left idling for 20 minutes at Wally's grocery stop. But then I came to the listings for the previous Saturday, 
a day of the week that, in the police log, tends to be dominated by reckless driving at the cocktail hour. This time, however, the first entry for Saturday read, Motor vehicle vandalized and filled with vegetable refuse reported at 24 Quarry Road at 6.05 a.m. I burst out laughing. Clover stopped talking and turned from the counter to face me. You find vaccination records a source of amusement? I tap the paper. This is priceless. Did you read this? She struggled not to look annoyed. Carrying a plate on which she placed a sandwich made with burlap bread, she looked over my shoulder. I read the item aloud. Vegetable refuse? Now there's something new. You didn't hear about that, said Clover. How would I? I'm no longer on the soiree circuit. I've been branded the town curmudgeon. You have not. In fact, you are the town savior in the opinion of 73 parents arriving to see their children's fabulous new school this evening. Until someone's precious, un sorry, I got distracted. Are we running behind, Peter? A little bit? Okay. Um, well, let's see. I'll, I'll read a little bit more and then I'll stop. I've been branded the town curmudgeon. You have not. In fact, you are the town savior in the opinion of 73 parents arriving to see their children's fabulous new school this evening. Until someone's precious little Christopher Robin breaks a toe on the flagstone walk or falls off that fancy jungle gym. Clover uttered a noise of exasperation, but she spared me the usual dose of her newfound philosophy about the magnetic effects of negative thinking. But this, I pointed to the paper again, this wins a prize. She sat down across from me and told me that some fellow named Jonathan Newcomb had awakened to find his brand new Hummer filled with corn husks. Like jam packed with the stuff. And there was this big sign pasted over the entire windshield and it said, ethanol anyone? <laughs> and they put it on with the kind of glue you can't get off. In New York, they use it to glue on notices when you don't move your car for the street cleaner. Who is they? The police, daddy. No, I mean the they who filled that car with corn. Just the husks. Nobody knows. I laughed loudly. I might even have clapped my hands. That's the most creative prank I've heard of in ages. All right, I'll stop there. I'll also, I'd love to answer questions now, but if you're coming to the panel that I'm going to be in, you can save questions till then, too. So, yes? Uh, on the revising and the crop side, uh, when do you know when to stop? You know, such as in watercoloring and you do it until it gets muddy. <laughs> That's a good analogy. Um, and, you know, I was an oil painter, and you, and you don't really ever have to stop when you paint with oils. So, um, uh, you know, I'm trying to remember what writer said when that pesky comma that's been bothering you gets taken out and put back about four times in a row, you know you're done. Um, the writer, uh, a writer that I love um, named John Dufresne says he's done when his editor wrenches the manuscript out of his white knuckled grip. Um, uh, you know, it's, I think it really is when you start going over the same passages with the very same concerns and, and almost um, neurotically changing your mind back and forth. It, it, it's, it's hard to say, um, but I think I, I would almost venture to say it's better to over than under revise. I don't think that really answers your question. It's, it's a very individual matter. Yes? I was wondering in I See You Everywhere, did you know when you started it that it was going to be a linked collection? Did you write the stories in the order that they are? And did you write it as a linked collection because you knew you could publish each story separately? Wow, that's a lot of questions all wrapped up in one. And the, the questions are, uh, um, I'll talk a little free form about I See You Everywhere and hopefully answer all the questions. That, the second story, 
in that book was the very first story I ever pub saw published. And, I, and it was published at a time when I had never written about the same characters twice. I swore to God that I was a short story writer. I would never write a novel. Um, it had a different title. It's, it's now called Now Is Not The Time. It was called My Sister Scar. It was a runner-up um, in the Nelson Algren fiction sweepstakes um, that the Chicago Tribune runs. Um, and what happened was, it, it was almost all my stories in, in the beginning when I was writing were, were pretty nakedly autobiographical. And that one was very much about the dynamic I had with my sister. The events were made up, but um, my sister was a very um, emotionally uh, reckless person. She was also very hardworking and successful in her field, her chosen field. Um, and I, the story expressed a lot of my concerns about her and the way in which those concerns played out in our relationship. And between the time that I submitted it to um, the contest and the time I found out that it was going to be one of the winners, um, my sister died. And um, so at the event where the stories were published and there was a sort of a banquet, the editor of the book review section of the Tribune told me that he really loved this story and that he was particularly taken by that the character of the younger sister, the, the reckless one. And he said, I hope you're planning to write more stories or more about these two sisters because I would really love to see them go on. And here's where I referred in my talk to, to writing out of a kind of therapeutic urge. Because at first I thought, well, I could never do that. And then I thought on sort of a, on a psychological level that as I went through this terrible loss and, and mourning period, for my sister, that if I were to write about two sisters based on us, in a way I could kind of examine the relationship, I could revise history, I mean I could do all kinds of things and remain in a relationship that in the real world no longer existed. And so I wrote three or four other stories and interestingly those were the next stories published in different publications. Um, but at that point, Basically, I was told if you want to publish a book, you're going to have to write a novel, and I didn't envision this as a novel. So to make a long story short, I wrote Three Junes, and then I wrote The Whole World Over, and then I thought, am I going to go back to these sisters? And I thought I would really like to complete a series of stories about these sisters, um, and I wrote, then I wrote the first story, and um, so they, they were not written in order, um, or initially, I mean, I really had to go back and revise the ones that were it's like a decade old at this point. Um, and I wrote the last one last, I did. Uh, and the couple, and all were eventually published in journals except for the first and the last. I actually withheld the last, um, the first one nobody bought. Um, but that was not, but I did do it so that I could get them published. Um, you know, you just, nothing. you can't, it's very hard. You know, even now, I should say, for those of you who assume that once you've won a National Book Award, you get published, I get rejections all the time. From, for my fiction and my nonfiction, I mean, I get accepted, but I have to try hard, almost as, I mean, I get answered right away usually because people know who I am, but it doesn't guarantee me anything. Um, and I thought that it would be called Linked Stories, but my publisher felt that they agreed it wasn't a novel, but they said that the reader really should read it from beginning to end, and when you put Linked Stories, it still tempts people to jump around. So the interesting thing is most critics just called it a novel. Only a couple saw that and, and acknowledge that it really is a collection of things. stories. And Peter, do we have time for one or two more questions? Or one more question? Anybody? Anybody? Yes? I was just wondering if, uh, if you have friends and family who mistakenly or maybe they recognize themselves as characters. And <laughs> how do you handle that? Uh, you know, the, the, the joke is that you lose one friend per novel who sees themselves in there, whether they're there or not, and sees themselves as painted unflatteringly. I've actually got a friend right now who's begging to be in one of my books. I'm like, you got to be out of your mind. She says, you're going to fix me up with this really outdoorsy guy who's a great reader. And stuff. So, in fact, when um, this book went through a couple different titles, The Widower's Tale and uh, when this title sort of came up on the block, what, what we found is that men tended to recoil at this title. As the editor-in-chief of my publishing house said, ooh, widower, old, sad, tired. But all the women were like, ooh, an available guy. Um, 
and two Boz fiction, for God's sake. Now, interestingly, the only guy who really loved it was my mate, which you have to sort of wonder what that was. Um, but but um, so the same friend of mine who wants to be in the book said, asked me if he was available to her, and I said, till about page 100 or so. Um, you know, I have not had that. You know, I wonder sometimes if there are friends of mine who've seen themselves, but they haven't told me so. And I, there's one particular case, an ex-boyfriend who's a very good friend of mine. I, I imagine that he sees himself in a character in Three Junes, and there are elements of him in that character, and it is probably the most disagreeable character in Three Junes. So I think he chose... He made a crack at a dinner once about to my mate. He said, maybe you'll get to be in the next book. And that's all he said. So I think he decided our friendship was more important than bringing up this all this old stuff between us. Um, but I hadn't intended for it to be him. Elements of people I know creep into my characters. But I, um, I See You Everywhere stands apart from my other books in my mind because those two sisters really are based on me and my sister. The parents are, interestingly, less like my parents than... Well, the mother is less like my mother than the mother in Three Junes, who's quite a bit like my mother. I remember being told, again, this is one of these things you read in the writing books, and I read some novelist said, if, if a character in your book seems uncomfortably like someone you know, don't worry, just keep revising, and the character will individuate him or herself away from the person that you know. Well, this mother became more and more and more <laughs> like my mother, to the point where my mother read the book, called me, she goes, so... Is Maureen me? And I said, well, kind of. And she said, oh, I just love her. <laughs> a lot of people hate that character if you've read Three Junes, so I thought, oh, thank you. Um, but, but I'll tell you what I've, what I've come to realize that's related to, but separate from what you're saying, and it's actually a little painful. You know, my parents, who are still alive, have, have fairly graciously gone through the publication of my books, and... My parents live in the sort of community where people are real readers. I mean, they really buy fiction and they read fiction. So all my parents' friends read my books. And what I've begun to realize is that my parents' friends assume, I think, that like what I write about parental characters must be true of my parents. For instance, since Maureen McLeod has an affair, surely my mother must have had an affair. And then I think, oh my God, you know, what my parents have to deal with other than, you know, their feelings about what I've written is their friends conclusions about what I've written like their friends probably call them and go you know so is it true that Carolyn had an ectopic pregnancy you know my sister which isn't true it's made up but you know even my mother may wonder so it, it you know it gets only in terms of your own family does it get to be a little painful I have my my in-laws are a big Catholic family with a lot of of shifting frictions and feuds, and I sometimes wonder. It, it's such great material, but I really stay away. <laughs> um, um, you know, I sort of thought it might lead them to be a whole lot nicer to me than they are, but uh, um, <laughs> they're pretty nice. They so be watching right now. They, they could be. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, Peter, should we? Thank you very much.